All right, so ready to tackle something huge. Today, we're going way back, like way back to trace the history of the English language. Ever wonder how we ended up with a language where wicked can mean something amazing? Mm. We're about to find out. Get ready for a crash course, centuries of linguistic twists and turns, all packed into this deep dive. And to guide us, we've got this amazing micro-credential course, super in-depth, but don't worry, we'll distill it down to the good stuff. No info overload here. Right. Okay, so picture this. Britain, way before texting, before emojis. What did people even sound like back then? Well, imagine a real mix, a whole different soundscape. You'd hear languages like those spoken by the Celts, mm. even some Latin hanging around from the Roman times. A real melting pot. And then boom, the Anglo-Saxons show up in the 5th century. Big change. These were Germanic tribes, the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and their languages. They kind of mashed together, and that's what we call Old English. Old English, so not quite texting lingo, right? Not even close. Mm. Think Beowulf, that epic poem. That's Old English. Now, imagine trying to understand that. Different grammar, words changing depending on their role in the sentence. Whoa, like a whole different operating system for language. So no quick Google Translate for that, huh? Exactly. You'd need a whole new language app. It's fascinating how much structure it had, but different. For instance, even objects had genders. Like a table wasn't just a table. It could be masculine or feminine, changing the whole sentence. That's wild. But even if it sounds totally different, Old English is where it all began, right? I mean, we still use tons of those words today. Absolutely. Think about it. House, woman, day. Those are pure Old English. Even place names like London, York, they have roots going way back to those times. It's like our language has these secret messages hidden inside, and if you know the code, boom, history comes alive. And it's not just the Anglo-Saxons. Remember the Vikings? Those Norse raiders? They left their mark on English, too. We're talking around the 8th century. Ah, the Vikings. I can already sense the language getting tougher. In a way. Their language, Old Norse, it gave us words like sky, berserk. Yeah. Think about it, terms born from seafaring warriors, now just a normal part of our everyday talk. Talk about history leaving its mark. Speaking of which, let's shift gears to 1066, the Norman Conquest. Feels like a linguistic earthquake was about to hit, am I right? Totally. Picture this. 1066 arrives, Normans conquer England, and their language, French, it becomes the language of power. Huge shift. So English, it gets knocked down a few pegs. You could say that. It becomes the language of everyday people, not the elite. And you know what? This actually forces English to change, to adapt. It starts simplifying its grammar, like it's trying to be more accessible. Wow. So the language fights back by getting simpler. That's kind of amazing. But it's not just about losing those complicated grammar rules, is it? English gets a whole bunch of new words too, right? Exactly. Think law, government, art, all those high status things. They start using crunch words for those. Justice, parliament, even art itself, all thanks to the Normans. It's like a whole new flavor got added to the mix. Out of this clash comes Middle English. It's like those cooking shows where they blend something unexpected and bam, something delicious. Perfect analogy. Middle English, it's this blend of Old English, a little Norse spice, and a whole lot of French. And we have one writer to thank for really showcasing it, Geoffrey Chaucer. Ah, uh, Chaucer. He was writing in the late 1300s, right? I bet that's a tough read now. It's definitely different, yeah, but so rich. The Canterbury Tales, his masterpiece, is like a time capsule. Not only is it in Middle English, but it shows off all the different ways people were speaking it back then, all those dialects. Man, I wish we could hear it, like even a little bit to get a sense of what it sounded like. Okay, so imagine this and picture the accent of the time too. One that April with his chivalrous sota, the drucht of March hath parsed to the rota. That's how the Canterbury Tales begins. Wow. I feel like I can almost hear the language changing, becoming more like the English we know. And that transformation, that's where things get even more interesting. It all starts with something called the Great Vowel Shift. The Great Vowel Shift, it sounds kind of technical, right? <laughs> but it's this huge change in how people pronounce vowels. And it started way back in Middle English. Imagine this. The A in father slowly shifting. The E in meat changing its tune. So basically a linguistic chain reaction, but did people just wake up one day and decide, hey, let's pronounce things differently, what happened? Uh, not quite overnight, more like over generations, a slow but massive sound change that took centuries. And the thing is, we still don't totally get why it happened. 
Some think migration patterns mess things up. Others say it's all about dialects rubbing up against each other. But whatever the reason, the result is what we hear today, those vowel sounds we take for granted, are actually a product of this crazy shift. Mind-blowing. All that history packed into the way we say our vowels. Speaking of shifting and changing, let's jump ahead to the Renaissance. That's when things get really creative, even in language. A total explosion. It's like the English language took a deep breath and said, time for something new. All these influences, ideas, everything's getting shaken up. And driving that change, you could argue, is the printing press, right? Talk about a game changer. Huge. It's like the internet before the internet. Imagine. Books, they weren't just for the wealthy or scholars anymore. More people could read, ideas spread faster, and suddenly you need a richer, more expressive language to keep up. So it's not just that the printing press made more books, it's that people wanted different kinds of books, which meant they needed different kinds of words, right? Exactly. And all of a sudden, it's like everyone's rediscovering Latin and Greek, those classical languages. Mm. The Renaissance was obsessed with classical learning and that obsession. It spilled over into English. New words everywhere. And who better to lead that linguistic shopping spree than Shakespeare? Talk about a wordsmith. He didn't just use language. He played with it. Oh, absolutely. A total innovator. We can thank Shakespeare for words we use all the time. Eyeball, fashionable, even swagger. They feel so normal to us now, but back then, totally groundbreaking. He wasn't afraid to experiment, bend the rules of grammar. And that's part of why we're still talking about him, right? That's not just the words, it's how he used them. Like that line from Romeo and Juliet, parting is such sweet sorrow, it just hits you with that bittersweet feeling. He was a master of that. Shakespeare showed everyone that language could be flexible, even playful, and that had a huge impact. He opened up all these new possibilities in English, and we're still exploring them today. Makes you wonder what he'd think of our language. Texting, slang, emojis, the whole deal. But before we jump too far ahead, I think we need to address the big thing happening in the background during all this linguistic creativity colonization. So picture this. English, it's not just this island language anymore. It's hitching a ride on ships, spreading across the globe with the British Empire. What happens when languages collide like that? It's a two-way street, right? Language yeah. isn't just imposed. It changes as it encounters new people, new ways of life. It's a conversation. So less about English taking over, more about it being shaped by these encounters. Exactly. Think about American English, Australian English, mm. even how English is spoken in India. They'll all tell their own stories. It's like American English. It didn't just decide to drop a British accent one day. New words popped up. Grammar shifted a bit. All because of those interactions with Native American languages, with all those immigrants coming in, it all leaves its mark, right? Absolutely. And that same process, language bumping up against language, that wasn't limited to just the colonies. Back oh. in England, the Industrial Revolution was happening, and that meant a whole new vocabulary was needed. It's like every time humans change how they live, language has to scramble to keep up. Suddenly you need words for steam engine, factory, electricity. Exactly. And where do those words come from? Sometimes they're borrowed, sometimes old words get repurposed, and sometimes, yeah, we just invent new ones. It's like language itself had to go through its own industrial revolution, mass production, but for words. Then, boom, the 20th century hits and things get even wilder. Right. Mass media, the Internet. Mm. Suddenly we're sharing words at the speed of light. And the way we use language, it's changing, too. More informal, more visual, I mean emojis. We're constantly inventing, right? Mm. New slang, new ways of getting our meaning across online. It's like language has gone into overdrive. And it makes you think, right, American culture, especially online, it's everywhere. That influences how English is used globally. And that brings up some really interesting questions about language and power. Makes you wonder what's next for English, doesn't it? Will it stay this global language, always changing, always picking up new things, or will we see it kind of split off, become even more different in different places? I don't know the answer, but it's up to us, all of us speaking this language, to decide what happens next. Whew. We covered a lot of ground today, from Old English to, well, now. Quite a journey for the English language. It never sits still, does it? That's what amazes me. Every invasion, every invention, heck, every text message, it all leaves a mark on the language. English is always changing, always growing. That's a great way to put it. Any final thoughts for our listeners? Something to keep in mind as they head back out into the world of words? Well, we've talked a lot about the big things that shape language, right? Migrations, inventions, technology. But what about the choices we make every day? The slang we use, the new words we invent, those shape English too. It's kind of amazing that power we all have. Every time we speak, 
we're adding to the story of English. I love that. The history of English, it's not just in textbooks, it's happening right now in every conversation, every tweet. We're all part of it. And on that note, thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the incredible world of the English language. Until next time, happy speaking.